Welcome to the Ashmolean Museum and the Viewing Art Mindfully podcast. My name is Ruth Collins and I'm a trained mindfulness teacher working with the Ashmolean. I would like to introduce you to the practices you will be doing today. We will begin with a mindful arriving and preparing to view practice. This will be followed by a talk from one of the curators from the Ashmolean who will guide you mindfully through a specially selected object from the museum. Coming to settle. Ideally, you will be sitting on a seat that supports you to be upright, relaxed, but alert, with your feet placed easily on the floor in front of you. If you feel comfortable about doing so, allowing your eyes now to close, otherwise letting your gaze drop and soften so that you are not looking at anything in particular. Setting an intention now to arrive fully by connecting with a sense of the body sitting. Perhaps you can feel the distribution of the body's weight on the chair. Let yourself be fully supported by whatever you are sitting on. Once you feel settled, just check in with your position. You might want to adjust your posture slightly to feel more comfortable. It can be helpful to lengthen the back a little, relaxing your shoulders, opening your chest, tucking your chin in slightly to elongate the spine to allow for a smooth flow of breath from the nose or the mouth all the way down to the abdomen and back again. Now, bring your awareness all the way down to your feet with the intention not being to think about your feet but to feel sensations in the feet. Notice the point at which your feet make contact with the floor the balls and the heels of the feet, the toes. Perhaps you can feel the toes lightly touching each other. Or maybe you can feel the texture of any material that's resting on the feet or the firmness of footwear encasing them. Allow yourself to gently and curiously explore each and every sensation that you can detect. And if you can't feel anything, that's fine too. Just being curious about this also. All the while, the mind will intrude and try to pull your attention away from the focus of the feet. Whenever this happens, as best you can, coming back to simply feeling sensations in your feet once more. Now letting go of your feet, turn your attention to your seat, your buttocks, your sit bones, your thighs on the chair. Bring your awareness to the sensations of sitting the firmness of the chair beneath you, the point at which the thighs extend beyond the end of the seat, perhaps, the sensations of clothing in contact with the skin. Maintaining as best you can a simple, non-judgmental curiosity as you explore sensations of touch and pressure returning to the anchor of sitting whenever the mind tries to entice you away to think about something else. As soon as you notice this happening, bringing your awareness mindfully back to whatever sensations you can identify while sitting on the chair. Moving the attention away from sitting now, and shifting the focus of your awareness to your hands. 
Feel your hands whilst they're still. Perhaps the hands are resting on each other or laying on your lap or the chair arms. Just taking a moment or two to explore sensations wherever you notice them. A feeling of roughness or smoothness on the surface they are lying on. A sense of softness or firmness of touch. There may be skin to skin contact where the hands connect. A sense of the spread or closeness of the fingers and thumbs. Working from the tips of the fingers all the way through the hands now. The backs of the hands, the knuckles, the palms. You may feel coolness or warmth as the air lightly brushes over the skin. The mind will wander as minds do. Whenever this happens, patiently and gently returning your focus to the physical feelings and sensations of the hands. Letting go of the hands now, bringing your awareness to your upper body and to the sensations of breathing. Not needing to change how you're breathing, but just tuning in to the natural rhythm of the breath that is already there breathing for you. Notice how the abdomen gently rises and falls as you inhale and exhale. For a moment or two, just focusing on following one breath all the way in and one breath all the way out. Perhaps being aware of a slight pause between the breath as you breathe in and the breath as you breathe out. If the mind drifts away or gets caught up in thinking, simply drawing your attention back once more to the anchor of the breath and the body sitting here breathing. With full awareness of the body sitting here, right now, and whilst continuing to keep the eyes closed or the gaze softened, gently expanding the spotlight of your attention to become aware of sensations in the body as a whole. Perhaps you feel the body moving slightly with the breath, a slight rocking or swaying or points at which the body makes contact with another surface, a slight tingling sensation, the coolness or warmth of the skin. Widening your awareness further, perhaps you can detect other things through the senses too. Maybe you can hear sounds around you, Sounds near and far. Keeping the focus on the aliveness of your senses, preparing to open your eyes now, ready to bring your full attention to the work of art presented in front of you. In this magnificent Japanese wall hanging, you see a group of five red-crowned Japanese cranes. They're standing among rocks and grass at the water's edge, surrounded by tall cycad plants, trailing white wisteria blossoms and sprays of bamboo grass. A border of brown silk brocade with a repeating dragon motif frames the scene. A closer look reveals that the entire design is embroidered in silk thread onto a ground fabric of black, finely ribbed grosgrain silk. The scale of the hanging is quite large, at two metres tall by nearly three metres wide. The background is actually made up of four rectangular vertical panels that have been stitched together into one large piece. 
but notice how the joints have been carefully concealed by cleverly placed extra long strands of wisteria. The hanging was made in Kyoto around 1900, especially for the foreign market, at a time when things Japanese were hugely popular in Europe and America. It was presented to the Ashmolean Museum by Sir Herbert and Lady Ingram, who travelled to Japan on their honeymoon in 1908. They may have bought the hanging then. Cranes are an auspicious symbol of long life in Japan and a perfect subject for a newly married couple. Although the fresh colours of the work suggest that it was rarely, if ever, displayed after their return. A range of different stitches and threads creates an extraordinary variety of textures and effects across the hanging, bringing the scene to life. The minute depiction of feathers, petals and leaves in textiles like this was part of their appeal to European customers, who marvelled at the technical skill of the embroiderers who created such paintings out of silk. Perhaps most striking are the beautiful white feathers of the cranes, so glossy you want to reach out and stroke them. These are embroidered in flat stitch, using flat, untwisted strands of silk with a rich sheen that perfectly expresses the texture of feathers. Notice the way the stitches follow the natural growth patterns of the feathers and the three-dimensionality where the feathers overlap, an effect achieved by building up layers and layers of stitches over a base of cotton wadding. And see how a mixture of long and short stitches in different colour threads has been used to create naturalistic shading in the tail feathers or on the crane's heads and necks. The embroidery would have been done by men working together around a large embroidery frame for months on end, transferring the design from an original painting. The detail is astonishing. Look at the eyelids made from clusters of tiny round knots and the scaliness of the crane's legs and feet, their knobbly knees, or the crisscrossing blades of grass in varying shades of green, their layout meticulously planned, or the rough bark of the trees and the craggy rocks, worked in a combination of loosely and tightly twisted threads. More knots create moss and lichen texture on the rocks, while the effect of the water surface in the lower right of the hanging is achieved by individually couching down long, extremely fine silk threads in parallel lines, with slightly thicker threads forming a pattern of ripples. The ripples suggest movement and perhaps even the gentle sound of water lapping against the shore. You can see that in places, the delicate threads have been broken and pulled. Silk textiles like this are extremely fragile and vulnerable. Light can weaken their fibres and cause their colours to fade. Pollution can dirty their surfaces. And insects and everyday wear and tear can take their toll too. In general, though, this hanging is an extraordinary condition, a rare survivor with its colours still vibrant and almost all its embroidery intact. Birds and flowers together have long been a popular subject of Japanese art. They usually represent a particular season, in this case, late spring, when wisteria flowers in Japan. The colour scheme is simple and harmonious, a limited palette of black and white, green, brown and grey, lifted by the flashes of scarlet on the birds' faces. The composition is busy, yet balanced and peaceful. Notice how the crane's poses complement each other, their legs all at different angles and the neck of each bird unfurled a little more than the next. Only the bird on the right seems agitated, his feathers ruffled and his neck extended. The line of his neck forms a strong diagonal, drawing the eye upwards towards the tallest crane, second from the left, who forms the apex of a triangle of birds. He gazes out of the hanging directly at us, fixing us with a stare that's part comical, part unnerving. The busyness of the gathered birds and the almost tropical feeling densely depicted plants is balanced by the empty black space on the right. In terms of colour too, the black background forms a striking contrast to the white of the petals and feathers. If you look closely at the extra long sprays of wisteria blossoms, you can see that they fall in front of the cranes. This cleverly draws the viewer into the scene, creating a sense of depth within the picture without using European linear perspective. See how the spray of bamboo grass at the lower right works in the same way. 
Yet many of the other strands of wisteria trail behind the cranes and through and behind the cycads at the back of the composition, as if the entire scene were set beneath a trellis of wisteria. Even we, the viewers, feel as if we're standing beneath the cascading wisteria, invited right into the idyllic, unspoilt natural world depicted. For the Ingrams and their contemporaries in the rapidly modernising Britain of the early 1900s, the romantic idea of a pre-industrial paradise in the faraway fairyland of Japan would have been especially appealing. <laughs>